Yes. In fact, do you know, and this is, I can say it perfectly honestly because it happened, that about a year before the end of the war, when AGMA, the American Guild of Musical Artists, was formed by Heifetz, yes. whom I admired all my life and still do, he wanted to form this to protect the musicians who were not included in the chart of the Musicians' Union, therefore choristers, mm -hmm. and self-employed musicians. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he made the greatest mistake of his life then to have signed up orchestras because then he went straight into the, in competition with the, and he defeated his own ends with by the raising, union, yeah. raising the union's ire and Petrillo forcing every self-employed musician to become a member of the union, which would not have been the case had Heifetz not insisted that Agma sign in orchestras. But when he came to see me here in New York, he said, you know that the war will soon be over, that we will soon have an influx of European soloists, and we must protect ourselves. Well, of course, that wasn't good enough for me, and I didn't accept. But there is no doubt that there was a certain amount of professional keeping those sure. musicians out sure. of the country. Sure. It's like uh, now we're reading a new book called The Abandonment of the Jews, where we were Roosevelt the great hero and Churchill they they could have saved hundreds of thousands yes. well will you ever forget well you were not born then perhaps but the ship that was turned away with Jews from Cuba yes sir. by Americans yes it's it's in that book the I mean, that is unbelievable unbelievable and what irritated me i must say was that the those who is, who came out from Germany would then condemn those who stayed in Germany, where very often those who stayed in Germany showed greater courage than those who left. Fort Frangler was naturally German through and through, representative of the highest German tradition, Ritter tradition, you know. Mm -hmm. And we all know that the German Ritter had nothing to do with the Nazi. I mean, the army was never a Nazi army. They were forced, and they had in each regiment Nazis, yeah. uh, as the commissars have in the Russian army. But the army tradition in Germany was a very fine, uh, clean, yes, had clean been, army yes, tradition. Sure, sure. The British respected them. They respected the British. And so were the naval tradition. Well... And Fort Frangler's father was a Greek scholar, and he himself was an archaeologist, and so on and so forth. So they were a different breed from the cheap for Nazis, who were really gangsters. The Nazis were, by definition, gangsters. Absolutely. Every one of them was a gangster. And uh, the gangsters ruled the country. I mean, we could imagine that a group of gangsters might get control of, of, of Washington. And, That's why I advocate ten presidents... No longer do we need one. Yes, yes. But I don't think they will. I mean, Nixon, Nixon's lot was verging on that. And uh, I don't think that will happen. That can happen yeah. in this country. We We're still should advanced. have a committee of at least five or six people that are president, w you leading the, um, the artists, you yes. part of that. And I think that nothing yes. will get done, and that's yes. important yes. now. Certainly, the, the presidential job is too big for one man. Oh, absolutely. That, that is true. Well, even on French ships, there were two captains. There was one captain for navigation and the ship, another one to, for the social life to keep the passengers happy to dine, that wanted to dine at the captain's table. Practical. Very practical. Common sense. Yes. And um, it wouldn't be a, a bad principle to follow. The French are sometimes very, very clever. You know, um, it was an ideal of the so-called civilized world not to, um, or at least overtly, torture people anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and we thought that, you know, that would be it. We thought that was the Middle Ages. Yes, uh, exactly. Whenever, whenever, now it's back in full swing. From everywhere, from Uganda everywhere. to Argentina to Iran, everywhere. everyone everywhere. loves torture. And it's become an international... Um, how should I say, craft. Mm -hmm. They exchange information, they document it, 
There are machines built. There are electric gadgets built. I mean, it's an industry. It has a vested interest of its own. Extraordinary. The most important thing that could be done would be to document the names of every one of these people so that they would know that they would be brought to trial. Think of your accompanist when they found out yeah. he was a Jew, pianist, and, Jew and the, the pianist. pianist, the fingers would be broken yes, instantly. Yes. Think of such yes. gangsterism. Yes. Yes. We have it worldwide again, I mean, in yes. this century, this brutality of this yes. century. Yes. And then we have television that goes, and because the commercial world must cater to the lowest common denominator, we have therefore nothing but sex and violence. Violence is the quickest form of assertion, of assertiveness. Yeah. If you can't construct, you destroy, and you destroy quickly, and then you are famous for it. And so the most loathsome human characteristics, brutal, violent, disloyal, distrustful, these are coming to the fore because they are commercially viable. Commercially viable. Or they are viable in a state like the Russians, mm -hmm. where violence is state violence so that in a way they have it under control they have absorbed it into the state and the state does the violence and no one else is allowed to do it or encourage but one thing you cannot have is state drunkenness that really is common to all the russians mm -hmm. that's a great problem in russia and that's that's it's out of the tremendous too. boredom there there is yes. not no joy in in living it must no. be so bleak no, it's very bleak. Mm. Then the Swedes have it, and we have it too. Now, is Switzerland a civilized nation? Switzerland is unbelievably civilized. It's the best-run little country in the world. Maybe the word here is little. It has to all be little. Maybe. Maybe it has to be little. I don't know. But I don't know. No one knows the name of the president who was elected, <laughs> who was elected once a year for oh, a year. This is in wonderful. In rotation you know, between the German, French, Italian, and, and Romanche. And um, he's, it's true he's never a woman, but they are very... Well, they vote now, though. The They're women able to vote finally now, vote. yes. They're <laughs> very, very conservative. But and the tra president travels by streetcar. No one gets up when he enters the streetcar. And there's no show of military. Everyone owns a gun because he is... And, and he never misuses the gun. You never hear of a Swiss going berserk and using his gun in the wrong way. He's proud of his gun. He's defending his country. Well, how come Japan doesn't even have any use for guns at all? The people do not even know where armament or guns are made, ever. Really? Yeah. Well, they, they, there they're are so no good, murders there. They're so good at karate, probably. <laughs> they're wonderful in self-defense. You had said something once that we're, we're losing the touch of uh, music stemming from the human voice and as if it all springs from the uh, keyboard or the typewriter. Or the typewriter, yes. <laughs> but now, of course, with the synthetic sounds and electronic sounds, we can make, make music deliberately. The composer can make his music and put it on to tape without the, without the middleman, without the interpreter, without the uh, mm -hmm. performer. It's it's interesting. I have nothing against these experiments. I think they are useful and uh, in their way important to explore because our age differs from any other age in that we don't see black and white. We begin to see by degrees. There's a degree between noise and meaningful noise and music, between organized sound, collage of sound as we have collage for mm -hmm. paint for pictures. This experimentation into degrees, I'm not at all averse to, because I think it it it, it renders us a little more subtle mm -hmm. in our understanding that between the gorilla and the policeman, between the bad man and the good man, there are many stages and degrees so that we have something in common that may make it possible one day for us to... Mm -hmm be on speaking terms and, and as I say, redeem. Goliath them. may not have been such a monster, totally. No. And no. we know that even Hitler painted watercolors. Yes, yes. Mm. Whether Hitler was redeemable, I don't know. No, that was true monster. He was... Um, mm. Stalin was absolutely insane. 
Yes, yes. These people, how does it happen that these very few are followed by the many? Because, because they have the few. The many, by definition, can only follow a madman. Oh, that's the most depressing of all comments, though. Not at all. They, if they are really frustrated and they are miserable, and it's only a madman who would understand uh -huh. them and who could promise them the things that no sensible man would promise them, who would tell them things to build up their ego, their pride, who would say it's all these Jews or it's all these Pakistanis or it's all these blacks or it's all these whatever. It's all these Catholics, it's all these Irish, it's all these Protestants. I mean, we've always had that. And uh, Jews are by no means singled out to be the only persecuted race in the world. Uh, what about the Armenians? In fact, there again, I think the Jews naturally were taken up with their own suffering. But when they created the state, they should have, and when money came from Germany, which I wasn't in favor of, mm -hmm. I don't think you can buy off a crime like that. No. And the fact that you can pay that much and, and then wash your hands, not that the Germans have washed their hands. No. They haven't. They're very no. good about it. They are the most civilized nation in the world today because they're expiating a crime. And hmm. you have to have a measure of guilt to be civilized. And I think, therefore, the Chinese are wonderful because they are regretting the Cultural Revolution. Mm, they are now. And I think nations who have gone through that are actually more in a, in a, humanly they are in a better uh, state of grace. What about though the uh, the fact of East Germany and West? That's, that's a, a sore that's problem. A, that's a tragedy really. And when will there be a United States of Europe which well, Napoleon should not have become a tyrant but no. should have Exactly. They exactly. would have had a whole different world. Whole he had a chance. World. Beethoven well, knew he had a one chance. One of the greatest mistakes, of course, was the, were the Allies' mistake at the end of the First World War oh. to dismember the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Oh. And uh, again, the Roosevelt was, wasn't very clever with Stalin. There again. Clever? He was not even around, no, I no, think. No, he wasn't. He wasn't. And there again, we I mean, the anomaly of Berlin in the middle, surrounded by communist countries. But I think there is now a little movement. It's still extremely little. What's happening in Poland is quite remarkable. Polish people are extraordinary. What's happening in Hungary? They're extraordinary except for that virulent anti-Semitism which always has existed well, there. I know, but look, we have to learn to see the good and the bad. The um, once anti-Semitism is accepted practice, it makes the practitioner innocent. Hmm. Just as the southern white people living, abusing their slaves, not all did, some were good, but most of them, I mean, they were having slaves. And nobody in his right mind would accuse them of the white person behaving in anything but a normal way. As soon as it becomes accredited, sanctioned by tradition and normal practice, the Jews cannot condemn the Polish people. It's You have to condemn the tradition. And now that there are almost no Jews in, in Poland, the tradition is, is changing yes. and they are different now. Yes. They are becoming different. All the Russians are there to worry about because they preached uh, a change of heart. Mm -hmm. They preached and did in fact practice to some extent. And now they're going back to, uh, to an anti-Semitism, which is partly a response to the... Uh, you see, if the Jews had, and Israel and elsewhere, had worried about all those who were victims of fascism and communism, not only the Jews. Yes, yes, yes. It would have made a very, very great difference. In Paris recently, I saw this, um, the the memorial on some side street to uh, the fallen Jews. Yes, and, yes. And I it's know now that. guarded by the police yes, from, you know, I know. terrorists. And, and yet, it if just that, won't if, stop, will if it? If that had been a memorial to those fallen at the hands of the Nazis, Jews, 
gypsies, mm -hmm. Eastern races, lower races, to a false mentality that wouldn't have to be guarded by the that's police. That's so true. Yes. And that's where that's where we've gone wrong. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a greater performance than the one of the Beethoven Concerto in your career with that work than the Ferd Wengler one, which you described? That was a wonderful moment. And that for was you. a wonderful moment. I had perhaps an equal one or greater the last time I did in London last year. It was a concert in memory of my sister of Hefziba who died. And wonderful uh, pianist, wasn't she? Yes. Wonderful. And um, I, that was a very special Beethoven, too. What are your thoughts, just randomly, on the Tchaikovsky Concerto in your career? It's curious. I played it so often as a child, and then <clears throat> left it, came back to it in 1956, played it in London, and um, then came back to it again, when I made a tour with Fritschai and the Rias, the Radio Ox of Berlin, and then <clears throat> never recorded it. And to my astonishment, you know, I felt about it, that there were so many violinists that played it so beautifully that I could never play it more beautifully than they. Mm -hmm. And, um, but curiously enough, uh, two of the performances with Fritschai have been issued on pirate records. No mm -hmm. longer pirate because Italy has a wonderful law that I think after... 12 years or 15 years, it's public domain. And I was delighted to hear both these records are very good. So there are recordings of the Tchaikovsky Concerto <laughs> by me with Free Chat. Now, is that as difficult technically as it's reputed to be that our, our you know, said it's unplayable and so forth? I don't think it's more difficult than uh, than other you know, Prokofiev or mm -hmm. the uh, Paganini or... I don't think so. What is the greatest of the modern violin concertos? Bartok. The Bartok. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I would say. And what an occasion in your life it must have been when you opened up the package that contained, I don't know how it happened, but contained the solo so sound. sound. Well, at first, you know, <clears throat> yes, but my heart felt, fell... I thought I could never play the work. Right. I was so, and yet I knew I was going to play it, and I did play it within a month, and fortunately I did play it so that he could hear it. Within a month? Yes, I did. I did, and I played it from memory, and he came to the concert, and he was pleased, although I know that he must have listened for what he knew it would become. Ah, uh, wonderful. Um, well, he was very, I think, inspired by your playing. Well, he s uh, said some nice things, but I've, he was that wonderful. one of the greatest men I've ever met. Such a sensitive face, and he wonderful was... Wonderfully sensitive face, and uh, uh, a man of such economy of uh, statement mm. that he, he never said an unnecessary word even. Mm. But he was already sick, he already had leukemia at the time mm -hmm. I knew him. He was going, you know, to do two things, that he lived another few years. Mm. He had accepted a teaching post at the Univer Northwestern University in Seattle I to spend know. two years with the Red Indians of the Northwest. And they would have gained a musical language, their own. I often say that every culture should have its own Bartok. Mm. And he was going to spend the summer of, now what would it have been, the summer of 43 with me in California. And he had to cut that short because he d couldn't come out because of his physical condition. He was an awesome man. Did Louis Kentner know him? I know George Schondor Louis, studied with him. Louis Kentner must have known him in Hungary. Mm -hmm. They didn't know him Are you in still America. close to him? Oh, yes. What yes. a wonderful Beethoven yes, player. Wonderful, wonderful. Love pianist. his sonatas. Yes. Love the slow yes. movements. Yes. Deep. Uh, Anser May once said that... Um, he felt maybe that the, the aesthetic of the 12-tone uh, music was a false one. and it Did he actually yeah. say that? Interesting. And um, certainly very little has survived for the public. They don't want to hear mm. Schoenberg. They want to hear Berg, of course, but he was well, a romantic. Yes, he romantic, yes. Well, if Berg, without the 12-tone system, would be pure romantic. Sure. No, Weber and I still like very much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But it is an arbitrary system. There's no, no gain saying that. 
What? It, yes, it's arbitrary. Because every note is supposed to be equal. And notes are no more equal than human beings are equal. So maybe this is its fault. I think so. And yet, such is the genius and gift of great composers that they can can constrain themselves to any system and produce great music. Rilke said that there is an essential aloneness to works of art. And I know in your uh, autobiography you said you believe Picasso once said that uh, great art could cure toothache. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. But certainly the artist is creating, when he's creating, he's totally alone. No one can create for him. It's, yes. it's the height of individual existence, of uniqueness. Yes. There's no question of that. And, uh, of course, today we live in a world when um, well, the Chinese tried composing by committee. You remember? Sure. In line. But many things are done, many great things are done, perhaps no less creative, by teams today. I mean, the teams in Europe. Think of the moon. Exactly. That could have never been done by an individual. On the other hand, the works of art can only be done by the individual. Yes. There will probably never be in science another Einstein. I don't know. There are still questions in science that are... But it's become so collaborative that yes, many people do yes. it. it but, but it still doesn't exclude the one man who will suddenly see light. Uh -huh, yes. And see the obvious, because it's the obvious that eludes. The obvious is usually oblivious. Yes, yes, absolutely. It's well said. As a, a child, you, you had said something like, uh, did I know instinctively that to play was to be? Yes. You still feel that? Or when you're on the podium, do yes, you feel yes. conducting is your new outlet? Yes, yes. What? I enjoy it very much. Mm. It is it is a deep human experience. The violinist or the pianist, the instrumentalist, live such a solitary existence in many yes, ways. yes. But that's um, that's by choice. But, by or choice. is it because many just had perfect pitch, and all of a sudden, because they were their prodigies, um, they have to go on with this. Yes, it's but it's it's very, if you <coughs> making a sound for yourself on the violin or on the piano, it's an exclusive thing unless you're playing four hands or playing two pianos. It's uh, you can't can't tolerate a competing sound or another sound unless again you're playing in an orchestra but that's why I enjoy so much working with musicians either in chamber music or orchestrally I'm you know I'm so sorry I have I don't want to take advantage of you you must be so tired but I, uh, you are so interesting, and you're well, giving me a remarkable. I want to ask you such questions as you know, uh, you know, right now today, Wagner in Israel is still such a touchy issue. Well, that's understandable. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, I think Zubin handled it very well, and said, "Look, those who feel strongly about it needn't stay for the encore. Let them leave, mm -hmm. and the, the, those who would like to hear those." <laughs> There's many refugees, German refugees in Israel, who are more German than than, than anything else. Sure. So, you Wagner was an intolerable fellow, oh but yeah. he was a very great genius. Yes. There's no question. But opera is not really important to you, is it? Well, since I conducted now Mozart opera, I've conducted Così fan tutti, the Inferno, of course the Impresario little one, mm -hmm. La Finta Giardiniera. And this in Bonn was my fifth one, Titus, a Clemenza di Tito. I so enjoyed it and felt so excited at having the whole expression of human existence in visually, dramatically, in sound, in speech, in mm -hmm. movement, in mime, in singing, in choral singing, in orchestra, and working on a score of Mozart's quality. I don't say I'd want to do any opera. I don't think you'd be interested in doing, let's say, uh, La Sonambula. Well, perhaps. I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to do a Verdi opera. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just, just for the... La Forza del Destino. But those have been done very well, I'm sure. 
Someone once said to me, I said, oh, what a shame that um, that uh, the library at Alexandria was yes. burned. Yes. And he said, oh, he didn't think so. He felt that almost all the books there must have been superstitious, junk. What nonsense. He was happy about it. He thought that the world could begin again. Oh, but what total nonsense. Those books contain the knowledge of thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Not as we say, you know, civilization began 4,000 years ago. Civilization began... So it was a horrible moment, that fire. Horrible, horrible. Mm -hmm. And as there were no copying machines, those manuscripts mm -hmm. were unique. Even if it was a lot of junk, it would have been important. No, it wasn't junk. It wasn't, wasn't junk. junk. It was the whole knowledge of medicine, astronomy. No, it took, it took, it took, 1,700 years mm -hmm. to make up for that fire. I see. That's an important thing we're discussing then. Few people yes. think of that moment in history, yes. that one place going mm. in, in, you know. It put the Mohammedans back mm -hmm. a great deal and put the world back. Mm -hmm. They brought us the uh, mathematics as we know it, though it did happen in India too, the mathematics. To me... I don't know to others, but to me, vibrato on a violin is an elusive mystery. I don't... Well, it's uh, actually part and parcel of playing the violin. You can't really play the violin without vibrating, if you play it properly, because the limbs should be so free and loose that um, it's, it's part of the flow of the music that you can't really... I have a method for vibrato, it's true, but it's, it consists really in freeing the limbs and fingers from all obstacles. Mm. And um, it's, it's part and parcel of, it's the voice. I know that certain schools of violin playing cultivated a vibrato-less uh, playing, like um, Calvé, the Calvé Quartet mm -hmm. in Paris, who believe that every note should be just pure and no vibrato mm -hmm. on the false assumption I'm convinced that all this business of the vibrato having originated in the romantic era and the pre-romantic and Vivaldi not having vibrated that's nonsense you couldn't be an Italian violinist producing a beautiful sound unless you vibrated mm -hmm. nor could you be a good violinist without vibrato I'm convinced that that's so Paganini had a Paganini certainly vibrated there's no mm -hmm. question of that but uh, it's only in our days when, uh, you know, the engineers decided, as you remember, 40 years ago, there was a fashion to record pure sound with no echo. Mm -hmm. And they constructed these hideous studios <laughs> with no echo. Mm -hmm. And then they realized nobody bought those records. <laughs> and they had to ed add echo chambers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to give artificial echo to sound. And the same with uh, vibrato calve thought. And it's much more difficult to play without vibrato because you have to, the note has to be absolutely in tune. And it's a very good exercise mm -hmm. for if you can play very relaxedly without vibrato. Mm -hmm. But now the use of vibrato is another matter because you can't use the same vibrato in Bach as you use in Schumann or Brahms. It would be out of place. You can't even use it in Mozart the same way. It has to be much narrower. And if you play with harpsichord, you use an entirely different vibrato to the one you use with piano. Pia pia uh, vibrato that you'd use with piano sounds absolutely revolting and vulgar when you play with harpsichord. How interesting. So it's like try, uh, it's, it, you have to accommodate to each idiom yes. at all yeah. times. It seems to me that bad teaching in violin playing is, is more disastrous than in yes, piano teaching. Yes, because it, cripple, it cripples the whole body. Mm -hmm. That's the trouble. Do you think that the French really have a great love for the violin? The French have an intellectual passion for every art. The French are capable of love, but they are so sophisticated that their love must always be an, admi an admixture of love and, and, uh, and intellectual grasp. Mm -hmm. It's very, very interesting. 
the Germans can love indiscriminately. The French love is never indiscriminate. And um, nor is it ever free of a critical faculty. Mm -hmm. And um, the French aren't really a musical nation. No. But their <laughs> musical public is one of the best in the world because there's nothing they do that, that isn't, or that they cultivate, that isn't cultivated with a mind. So they will know if you're playing in style or not. Mm -hmm. They won't say, oh, I love him, he has the most beautiful sound. No, no. You'll have to have more than that to please them. And no other nation could have ever produced Debussy or Ravel. No, no. no I'm not sure about Chausson. Oh, Chausson is... The poem is, is so wonderful. Absolutely romantic. Yes. Absolutely romantic. He yeah. was a, he was more indiscriminate yes, than me. Yes, but that is. It seems to me that the French violin literature is is not that large. When I'm thinking about it, your one of your debut works, of course, the big war horse was the Lalo. Lalo. Well, that's very romantic, yes. and that demands passion, and that demands. No, the French have it, especially if they have a little Spanish blood, mm -hmm. and they do have it, Spanish or Jewish, or, but um, they are by by definition. A nation, an intellectual nation. There's the Debussy Sonata that comes That's to mind. That's beautiful. That work has been growing on me more than any other work. I love it. I can never get deep enough into it. It's a, it's a masterpiece. Mm. It's a masterpiece of the unpredictable, mm. of the impressionistic. And the logic that goes through the unpredictable, that is what's fascinate, what fascinates me there. It's a kind of study of fate in miniature, bringing the unpredictable event, and yet it makes total sense. Mm. It's quite amazing. Wow, you just were so articulate in describing yes. that. Uh, the Frank Sonata, of course, is wonderful, again, but romantic, overplayed romantic. now a little. Um, Thibault Lecour, was quite Lecour, a violinist. Like the much. Belgian, that sonata yeah. you, yes. you, you yes. played. Uh, did you know Corto? Yes, quite well. Both before and during our After must have been very difficult for him. It was difficult for him, but um, he, because he, the French felt that he had too good a time during the war. Well, he did. He did, yes. He did? He did. But I'm sure he suffered. Yes, he did. Afterward. He did. Mm. So we have here the Symphony Espagnole of Lalo. And there's we also have, a concerto of Lalo, yes. too. Yeah. And we have the Franck Sonata. We have the Foray. That's oh, yes, a wonderful, both. wonderful composer. Yes, they are, and there are two sonatas of Foray. Yes. The first one that everyone plays, the, the late which one. is charming, and the late one, which is really very, very different, totally different in character. He was deaf well, at very that time. Like, very like late Beethoven. Yes. His quartet Dis is... Disembodied, disembodied, um, uh, uh, rather ethereal, ungraspable, and yet in its own way very beautiful. Yes. Now, that brings me to the question of uh, exportable composers. Uh, you know that um, Foray certainly is not like Debussy or Ravel, exportable. He's, he's just not played here or in no, Germany. Well, there are less exportable French than Foray, like Vincent Dandy. Or Roussel. Or Roussel, exactly. Yes. Um, <coughs> even less exportable. You got in trouble with Novello for letting the parts be in, in Moscow of your concerto, really. I mean, the Elgar yes, concerto yes. is, to me, a, oh, what a work in your performance. Sometimes it's just like an angel coming out of... In fact, yes, I think he used different. that word even for his the second movement. Yeah. It was inspired yes. by some woman he knew yeah. and loved. Um this is a great romantic concerto. It has a little Richard Strauss in the orchestra. Yes, yes. Very influenced, very Germanic. And you yeah. gave it to them with your goodwill. Yes. And you said that it probably has never received a performance in romantic Russia. Why? Elgar is absolutely unexportable? Elgar has become exportable. Now, finally, after many, many decades of, of my playing it, but now they all record it. 
I think all my colleagues have recorded the Elgar Concerto. Zuckerman did a good job recently. Who did? I think uh, Zuckerman played it did with he? Baron Boim. Yes. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard any of them except the Korean girl um, with Shorty. Yes. Now, whether yeah. she inspired Shorty or Shorty her, I thought that was the most un-Elgar performance. Hmm. It um, it was played, seems to me, for the for the effect rather than for the intrinsic quality of the movie. It was, in any case, Shorty tends to be very rigid about tempi. And there's nothing more destructive of Elgar than an inflexible tempo. And, uh, well, you will hear when I do the enigma. I think it'll be interesting. But the, um, the one of the best new recordings, I'm told, I haven't heard it myself, was done by Nigel Kennedy from my school. Wonderful. So I'm glad about that. Well, that's an epic concerto. And, you know, it's, of course, always there in the repertory, but it just has not... Well, it's caught on now, though. It's something, though. It's wonderful. It's Certainly, it's the, l- it's the largest, I think, violin concerto, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Is there anything so. longer and bigger than no. that? What a work. Well, Elgar looked like the way a prime minister should. Didn't he? Yes. It must yes. have astonished you as a little it boy. It astonished me, yes. I, you are incredibly well put. I never met anyone who was more posted on what I said. It's, it's really rather frightening. My, a man my, going to the races. Boswell. Oh, it's just too wonderful. Yes, yes. Because I had known Bloch before. And I'd known Ravel, but Bloch to me was the epitome of the sort of prophetic creator. And uh, he looked the part. Biblical, as you say. Biblical, yes. But uh, Elgar was uh, <laughs> astonished, astonished me so much because he was so casual about it. And casual about conducting and casual about way he never tested me out he heard me a few minutes and then said he was a lovely summer's <laughs> afternoon so Saturday I think off to the races and we met at the studios two days later and he conducted that beautiful recording wonderful conductor but again without any kind of um, of our frenzy you know <laughs> um, he had he had in fact it's true of his greatest climaxes that they are benevolent climaxes they, they should never be hard. They should never be played with, uh, with sort of a Beethovenian uh, uh, tragic uh, um, uh, attack. Mm-mm. They they are always, always gentle, even at, at their loudest. Yes. Even in the two symphonies. Even in the two symphonies. Yes. That those two symphonies are to me the the just height of Edwardian luxury. Yes, absolutely. And the absolutely. slow movements, I must say, though I do smell some imperialism. Yes, do we? <laughs> Kipling, Kipling and India. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, well, it was in the air. Yeah, <laughs> it was in the air. But I don't think there have ever been any more innocent imperialists. Yeah. And any that did it more for the for the sheer exuberance of it, really. And there was very little sense of national ambition, mm-hmm. pride, control. Look, they ruled India with about 150 people. It's amazing. Le- leaving the Indians to their own devices, except that every Maharaja had a British advisor. Yeah. And he had to do what the British advisors suggested. Mm-hmm. But the system, the structure was left intact. And meanwhile, they got roads and parliaments and hospitals and trains and... Steinways came in Steinways on elephants. Steinways came in. And, uh, uh, no. Hmm. As far, it, I know that they had their horrible excesses. They did horrible things. But if you compare it to other empires, it was by no means... The, <laughs> it's you know, hardly Cortez mounting Montezuma. Yes, exactly, exactly. Not that at all. The Spanish went into their... Uh, their it was for sheer greed. Mm. The British, when you know the British, you know that they went in... Uh, they traveled to India for... to see the world. Mm-hmm. And India fell into their laps through the trading company. It was trade. Yes. It was trade and it was adventure because they lived on an island surrounded by water and they had to see where the water went to. Mm-hmm. They went as far as the water took them mm-hmm. and uh, it took them to strange lands which they wrote about, they painted. And they were they physically d- big, you know, compared to many people, so they needed to get off that little well, island. Not only <laughs> that, but many of the British look at Lear who traveled 
and they didn't have cameras. Mm -hmm. Innumerable of British drew, and drew beautifully. Yes, yes, yes. They were cultivated people who went with their uh, pencils and drawing boards and crayons, who brought books along and who read. Not many of them, it must be said in all honesty, appreciated the in Indian culture. But there were a few who did, mm -hmm. and there were a few who did translations from the Sanskrit and uh, others who... But the middle class who then came, you know, to fill the ranks of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. and, um, and the trading, they put on, they, they had to feel superior. It's always the, those who are newly arrived who have to feel superior. Yes. But those who are superior by either social position or breeding or heredity don't have to exercise it. Well, just look at the, the uh, of all the nobility of 19th century Europe, an English lord was beyond even the debtor's prison. You could be a French count or, or viscount or baron. Mm -hmm. It was nothing. But to be an English, yes. it, it brought Byron to, to yes. Albania, to yes. Greece, to, yes. to, to the harems of yes. Constantinople. Well, the, the Grand Tour was obligatory. And everyone drew. And Mendelssohn, of course, we yes. understand yes. how Mendelssohn would love England. Yes, yes. Uh, everywhere he went, he sent back home not only these amazing letters to the yes. family, but what drawings. Yes, there yes. was recently wonderful an exhibit drawings. of yes. his drawings. Are they wonderful? They're extraordinary. Wonderful. No Cult cameras. Those were people of real culture. Yes. Really. And the tr it survives in the French military and the British military to this day. Really. You have the head of the Air Force in France, who was stationed down in southern France, one of the most cultivated people. His father was a general, his grandfather was a general, mm -hmm. and their job is to lay down their life for their country, which they are prepared to do at any moment of day or night. Now, well, that's, that's... I know, it's an idea I would like to rid the world of totally, but I know exactly what you're saying look, right now. Look, it's, it's not the gorilla's idea, it's just taken in the stride of ordinary living. Yes. And people of very high self-discipline and of... I know them because during the war I met a great many, mm -hmm. and now with my LMN, you know the live music now, they they gave 300 concerts in, in the French army posts mm. last year. I me uh, mentioned the name Mendelssohn, and I, ha I can't resist now saying, give me just a moment on the Mendelssohn Concerto. How many times must you have heard yes. and played that? Mm. <coughs> That's, many, you know, to times. me the perfect Romantic concerto. It is. It's perfection. It's, it's a jewel. There's not, it's there's not, jewel. he never wrote anything. Well, certainly the piano concertos don't compare. No. I like some of the symphonies. I conducted them with the Berlin Philharmonic. Well, the fourth is wonderful. Last year, the, um, the, the, what, the, Protestant the Reformation. One, the Reformation. Number five. I love that. Yes, that's wonderful. But the violin concerto was perfect. Oh, that's perfect. Yes, it is. Ferdinand David yes. was his. And you, you you said something that every violinist should uh, work with a composer. You, well, or yes, it's it's a great satisfaction to know to be with music from its original creation. I mean, I've I've been very fortunate that way, with Bloch, with Bartok. Why is Bloch others. neglected today so much? I think they probably the modernists feel that he isn't modern enough. And the Romantics go back to another period. But he was, in fact, one of the greatest contrapuntists ever. And his voice leading is second to none, no one. Um, I love his violin concerto. I've done it in New York. You remember I did it, the famous mm -hmm. encore episode. And I love the fact that your father made you open your German recitals as a... With the with Brochny the, Gun. Yeah, isn't that something? Last, the last group I did. Mm -hmm. Mm. First time when will this, um, or will it ever, is the competition here to stay on every uh, corner? There's a, a new competition, either for pianists, violinists, on every corner. I know there are far too many competitions. However, having begged off the London one, I was asked by the city of Paris to organize my own competition. They did it with Russell Povich, who did the cello competition. And the terms are very interesting. 
And they said, look, we will support it. We will do all the mailing, all the administration, all the paperwork. You choose your jury. You make your own laws. Mm, interesting. And so that intrigued me because I thought, well, maybe I can conceive of a different kind of competition. It's going to take place this coming uh, September in Paris. And, uh, for instance, I wanted to get away from the hero. Mm -hmm. And so I have seven categories of violin music, each of them ha with a prize for the best. Pre-romantic, classical, contemporary, oh, wonderful. salon. Oh, salon. Yes. That's wonderful. Well, I thought that's essential. Instead of having everybody compete for the last... It's about time giving that a new status. Exactly. It's and improvised music and so on and so forth. So um, this was my, I thought, here's my chance. Even in Vienna, the, the, where they could have had calling of the Chrysler competition and where they could have had gypsy fiddlers and salon fiddlers, they didn't do anything of the sort. They didn't even use uh, the, the best the Chrysler pieces which would have revealed that. But anyway, the, um, the idea is hmm. that it's the opposite of the Brussels, where I'm going, which, to which I'm attached, because I've been there every four years. It's traditional. It has its own kind of rigid traditional Your friendship idea. with the queen? Yes, and before. I continue. But there, the jury isn't allowed to talk to each other and not to the musicians and so on and so forth. My competition, it's experimental. It's just the other way. Mm -hmm. The jury have the right and even the obligation to listen to rehearsals before, mm. to give advice to the artists. The um, hmm. each category is judged by the jury, uh, and uh, we have Grappelli for the jazz, and we have harpsichord players for the um, pre-classical, and so on and so forth. And they will be playing with harpsichord. And then there is because we couldn't escape a grand prize for the last will be three concertos, six concertos, I forget, with orchestra. We have uh, Orchestre de Paris. Mm. And uh, this excellent young French conductor who was the concert master. I wish I could remember. You must find out his name. Assistant now to Danny. And uh, by winning in any of the cat to inscribe themselves, they have to first of all send a tape with their choice in th in at least three of the categories. In other words, they can't come in playing only salon. They have to come in uh -huh. playing salon. Bach and I don't know Indian music or whatever yes. or, or, or romantic. Also, they must have scales and uh, arpeggios. Yes. And, uh, and once they are accepted, it may well be that they theoretically someone could excel in all seven categories. Hmm. It won't happen. Uh -huh. It can't happen. Nobody has everything. No, nobody has everything. But at least that way it spreads mm -hmm. the uh, how shall I say the the, the merit. And for those who gain a prize in any of the categories, they will have corresponding opportunities. Thus, the salon, one will be able to play in the best, most exclusive nightclub, oh, you see. Uh -huh. and, will uh, they play Vianovsky? I don't care what they play. <laughs> Sarasate, <but>. Ernst? <laughs> yes, all of those. Wonderful. These are all these are all violinists that came after Paganini who not only enriched the um, the literature with some nuggets of gold that culminated probably in Chrysler, but um, they toured everywhere. They made they made the uh, they gave the nineteenth century a whole new yes. view. Yes. Vianovsky came here in eighteen seventy two with Anton Rubinstein. Yes, Everyone talks dying. about Anton yeah. Rubinstein's tour, but he yeah. was with I see. I didn't realize was with him. That. Steinway most, brought him too. Most interesting, and of course, Isai conducted the Cincinnati Symphony. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you think Tchaikovsky conducted here, didn't he? Lived right uh, at, the, um, at the Dakota. Yeah. And he looked out over the park and he wrote, because he thought it was Gustav Schirmer's whole home, and he said that not even the Tsar has a palace like this with, with such a view of a park. Yeah, interesting. So Tchaikovsky was here and it was... Um, and didn't Mahler come as and well? And Mahler was here yes. and Rachmaninoff and Mahler uh, premiered the third piano concerto of Rachmaninoff. Think of Rachmaninoff and Mahler so, in 1909 sword, together. Sword I'm glad I heard Rachmaninoff in New York when I was a boy. He, he, <coughs> he was something like Chrysler in that Wonderful kind of elegance. Yes.
and they played yes. the Greek C minor sonata, yes. which is is quite wonderful yes. on recording. It's still, yes. But um, well, there is so much, and I, I'm glad to hear that there's a salon c category because yes. the, the Vuitton concertos yes. are they're wonderful yes. works. All the pieces, the Rondino, and all these, yeah, excellent pieces, and. Um, and they'll be able to receive a prize for that without necessarily having to perform a concerto. They may not be. They may play that wonderfully and just yeah. can't really play the yes, style yes. of uh, Beethoven yeah. as well. Without necessarily having to perform a concerto. They may not be. They may play that wonderfully and just yeah. can't really play the yes, style yes. of uh, Beethoven yes. as well. That's wonderful. What is uh, Scholz and Etzen's position now is a strange one in the world, Who's don't you think? Uh, the writer, uh, Solzhenitsyn? Solzhenitsyn, yes, yes, because it is so cruel, really, for a writer to be divorced from his own mm -hmm. his own soil. Uh, Rostropovich is delighted because he makes music wherever he goes and has these wonderful audiences that feed him. But a writer lives a solitary life, and when he's divorced from his own language and his own country, He's really like uh, shipwrecked. Did you see the movie Mephisto w uh, based on that novel? No, I didn't. Mm. The, the torment of the, uh, uh, of the actor leaving his language. Everyone's mm. leaving. I'm an actor. I only, I, I only act in German language. Mm. Yes. These things are not so simple. No, they're we, not. The black and white no. must be stopped. <laughs> yes. It's not simple. Um... You have you have just come from London. I, I have taken so much of your time and energy. Well, I, I've I'm touched. It. Never mind. I would I've love to. It. I would love to talk about uh, your relationship to Indian music. Why um, Koreans and Japanese have seen fit to spend hours after hour doing the Beethoven concertos. They have no interest or knowledge in their own music. Well, is it the harmonic the, the thing? The Chinese, you know, my at my New York concert with the uh, Connecticut Royal Philharmonic, one of my solos will be Jin Lee, mm -hmm. my little Chinese boy from uh, was sent from Peking. Excellent talent, wonderful talent. Western music seems to be it's um, a universal music, a universal because, music because it it has adopted the tempered scale. And that tempered and scale, the has, harmony, the the harmony har has yes. given that, that no added other, emotion. No other native music has the harmony. harmony for a very good reason, and that is that they didn't want to distort the pure intervals. And this, of course, the loss of this pure interval is to composers like Musoni or Scriabin yes. was a disaster. Yes. Now the piano is so rigid. It's so rigid, and the more I play with the piano, piano tuned in the ordinary way the more I'm irritated by the discrepancy of uh, pure intervals. But I can imagine. Um, there is an extraordinary man, Serge Cordier, in France, who is the greatest authority on tuning. And he has a, a system to, he wrote a very thick book, tuning throughout the ages, you know, various periods and how they used to tune, so on and so forth. Very, very knowledgeable man. And he has a system which is bliss to play with hmm. because the fifths are true, hmm. the octaves are somewhat altered, and the ear can take it. And as you go up in the piano, the notes get a little sharper, mm. which is what our ear wants. Mm -hmm. To play with that tuning is a new experience. The sound and the resonance is twice that of the ordinary piano. So I am insisting, I hope I shall succeed, to have the Bösendorfer, because Steinway won't hear of it, no. to have the Bösendorfer piano here in New York tuned by Cordier for my recital here. And trying to persuade Bösendorfers to have a tuning workshop the whole Saturday of March 17th, where they will have three pianos available to singers, violinists, string players, tuned his way and one the other way, and they can compare. How, how have you kept this immense and it's one of your chief characteristics, curiosity, a well, constant I'm, experimentation. Well, I just like adventure, I suppose, mm -hmm. and I'm interested in anything better. Would you go to the moon and play a recital? No, <laughs> no, no. I don't think I'd want to go to the moon because it might endanger many other things that I'd rather do. Mm -hmm. I'd rather take a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
around 1900 an Indian was in England and he was hearing for the first time um, a Haydn symphony at a concert and a Wagner overture and they said how did you like it and he said oh all this western music sounds like military music to me of course it's so of course unsubtle rhythmically really compared to the Indian music yes yes but that's an interesting yes, response. Interesting. It was all of course, the only public, the only Western music they heard in India at that time were British bands. Ah, that's probably why. That's so true. every harmonic music, yeah, probably especially as our rhythms are fairly constant, yes, and very relatively simple compared to compared, compared they could do. In, yes, you still see uh, Ravi Shankar. Yes, indeed, I do. I'm not going to go into that because people should read your autobiography and you will understand so much about your feelings on that art. And yeah. it's, it's amazingly well explained. I don't know how mm, you were able to I'm get glad. this in print. How it mm. actually, mm. how you coordinated these yeah. ideas into language because they're difficult. But I think much of what we spoke today, I've never, particularly never said. So no, this is so what I was saying. Yes. This is new material, yes. and I really, the, I had no idea where we would go. But let me tell you, I, I really do now want this into a book for I'm your seventieth birthday. So I just, I'd like you to give me that permission to look yes. for a publisher. Certainly. 